anchored correctly. Okay, so I've started. We're, we are now live. Hi. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. AJ, I can see you in the room, but you're not right now. You did the way you logged in. You didn't log in as a speaker, so we can't hear you. If it's possible for you to log out and log in as a speaker, um, I think that would help things a lot. Um, let me start by sharing. Is that coming through clearly? Can you guys see the screen share okay? Yes. Okay. So let's start this. This uh, We'll just start um, um, yeah. since this is being recorded. Um, and that way, I know they have to like to hold us pretty close to time. Um, we'll start just to sort of welcome to the session for everybody. Um, as people, I, I assume they're coming online as they leave um, the previous sessions. Um, what we're talking about in this session is sort of the uh, how has the the environment for innovation changed post pandemic. Uh, just sort of to get things started a little bit here. Um, this is uh, from a paper called The Importance of Startups. Um, and it talks about that on one side of the column, it lists here's all the advantages of why you, you want a strong entrepreneurial economy. Uh, how does that play into uh, advancing um, what's happening in a country, in a region? Um, and on the right hand side, you'll see another column that talks about sort of pre pandemic things that were thought of as being some of the prerequisites or some of the things that should be done to sort of encourage that kind of an entrepreneurial economy. Um, access to venture capital, government policy, tax policy, academics, mentors, all these things are fair game to talk about in this session. And what we really want to do is, is just have sort of an open discussion about how the environment for innovation has changed in the post-pandemic world. Um, with that, let me see if I can get this to, there we are. So here's, here's the um, outline of uh, what was listed in the program. Um, and we have our speakers listed there. Um, we're going to go around the room and sort of have everybody introduce themselves. Um, but for sure, anybody who's listening in on the audience, if you want to follow up with any individuals, there's our emails as well. Um, so feel free to reach out to us um, after the fact if you want to continue some aspects of the conversation. Um, with that, Angela, do you want to start off and, and tell us a little about yourself and uh, Tempo Bioscience? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. And so uh, thanks for having me here. Um, it's a little early in California, but uh, I'll try. So Tempo Bioscience is a startup company in the biotech industry. We work with specialized adult stem cells. They're called IPSCs. It stands for induced pluripotent stem cells. So there are two usages, possibilities, if you will, uh, for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the derivative cell types from these stem cells can be used as research models for drug development, um, preclinical drug development and R&D um, in the biotech and pharma industry. And as stem cell therapy, um, IPSC-based, they can be developed eventually into universal um, allogeneic novel therapeutics. So there are two usages of these cells, and we work with scientists and um, and also clinicians um, within the pharma industry to expedite drug development. And for myself, I'm a scientist by training and uh, founded Temple Bioscience some years ago. It is still a startup um, in the industry. And we work with scientists from all over the world. Excellent. Navrook, do you want to introduce yourself and your company? Sure, happy to. Thank you so much, Eric, and a uh, pleasure to be here while we are trying to bring on board our fellow panelists and uh, multitasking here. Um, and uh, great, great to 
meet everyone. Um, it's my first time uh, sharing the room with Jerry and, and Angela. And uh, I was just joking about how a lot of the biotech stuff is kind of over my head. I'm an economist by training and I run a platform called The Digital Economist, um, which is a year and a half old to be launched at the World Economic Forum last year uh, in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the forum and convened over 300 CXOs around a shared mission of building a human-centered digital economy. How do we use technology ultimately for human outcomes? And I think somewhere along the lines, we've lost sight of that, and and, and that's really the mission of our ecosystem. Uh, we call it an impact platform, uh, and super excited to be here. And, and and I think this is the topic of this panel is really close to uh, what we've been focused on really for the past year and a half is how do you actually leverage, um, you, you know, and not just innovation in the post-COVID world, but also COVID-19 uh, you know, as a crisis and sort of use that as a way to, um, you know, um, push us forward towards a better future. So I'm really excited to uh, share more, talk more, uh, and uh, perhaps even share some of the insights. Uh, I've started innovation um, academically. That's what my uh, master's degrees are on and I've been focused on over the past uh, seven, eight years. Um, and uh, I'm happy to kind of be here and, and, and share more. Oh, sure. And I'm Barry Power. I'm CEO of i3 Systems, and I'm also the founder of the i3 Consortium. Um, i3 Systems is, is a startup that uh, develops and supports real-time data networks um, that span organizational geographic boundaries. The, the concept of i3 was originally um, discovered, worked on when I was at University of Southern California, um, and we understood that the federated world was sort of being left behind and everything was sort of being done in data-driven and silos, and we set about to sort of break those down. Um, and that, of course, means a strong focus on privacy, trust, and incentives as sort of things that make people feel comfortable in an environment where they want to share their data. Um, I don't know if anyone else has joined us, any of the other speakers. Um, let me switch the windows here. Okay, that's cool. Um, and we'll just we'll just kick off right into the session. Why, why don't we start though by talking a little bit about before we talk about innovation opportunities? Let's talk a little bit about how the pandemic has sort of changed customers' our view of the market. Um, I don't know who wants to kick that one off. Um, but I think that's the first thing we got to talk about because obviously entrepreneurs and customers, they're focused on customers. Um, I can take that up. Um, well, I, I want to say, I want to start by saying it's a, it's almost a little late to talk about that story given that uh, we're a year and a half and it feels like a different world altogether. And I, you know, in, in sort of my reflective space, I look back to think, uh, wow, you know, we've, We've kind of changed <laughs> for for good in many ways, and I think same thing applies to the structure of the economy as well. So I think your question is spot on, and and not only the customers and their behaviors have changed, right? Um, but also I think um, the from from a more uh, supply side of things, uh, the adapt that businesses had to do has also brought about permanent changes to the economy. And many of those are here to stay. Some things would go back as we're seeing some sort of normalization, particularly here in the U.S. And this is, of course, a um, an India-focused meeting. Um, but I think uh, at the same time, uh, we are looking at these structural changes of what Joseph Schumpeter called the creative destruction of the economy, right? Some things that were not serving us will continue to kind of um, get dismantled. And of course, the exploration of digitalization is is uh, uh, is something that is uh, ringing on the wall. Uh, but also at the same time, I think what customers are demanding from businesses uh, has changed and uh, most specifically towards purpose. Um, businesses uh, need to have a purpose um, in order to be a, a real stakeholder in the global economy. So I'll pause there. I have a lot more to say as, as a 
you know, full-time entrepreneur multiply times uh, 10, uh, given that it's a 24-7 job, uh, and, and let Angie. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, I'll try to answer it from a biotech-focused point of view. Um, so far, since 2020, um, a lot of scientific um, areas are starting to shift around. And um, from our point of view, it's good is because people are shifting from a lot of methods that depended on um, animal yeah. uh, modeling yeah. and other types of um, traditional models. They're shifting to more in silico, computational based, and also cell based. So we have increased uh, the number of projects that we work with uh, scientists. Um, for their drug development purposes overall. So so a lot of um, basically because of access reasons or because of collaborative reasons, lots of facility reasons, um, people shift the methods of their drug development. And I think um, well, as entrepreneurs, we always have to be flexible and ready to keep up with demand and also scale appropriately. So um, part of supply chain um, for us and also for the scientists we work with is constantly shifting now because of the pandemic. So I think everyone is trying to adapt um, because raw materials and chemical raw materials are important to the pharma industry. So I think everyone is adapting. So, so AJ, we're talking about like really how has the market, the customers, have they changed? Because obviously when we try to keep the innovation economy going, we have to sort of be responsive to the customer. I don't know if you have anything you want to add about how you see the market has changed. I think the market has changed because we have to render services and products more virtually and uh, retail has taken a beating. Access to people where people were going to give the services has been curtailed. So the, and of course, e-commerce is the way to the future. So the social media act of each company, we have to up it and we have to change and we have to focus more on health and well-being. So I think the market, while there has been a lot of things are being talked about, lifestyle things and others, but we have to really focus on products where we are able to service the needs of the people. So, sorry, I joined in late, so if the introductions are over, maybe I can do that later or now. Or no, why don't you go ahead and do it now, AJ? Yeah. So, I uh, have a company called Synergy Environics, and our main focus of work is that your well-being is our concern. So, we make uh, electro-smog protection products. We have... a uh, space uh, protection, which uh, takes care of 30 square meters. We have a chip for the mobile phone and the laptop and other things. We have a gadget disinfectant, which takes care of the bacteria on your phones, which is 20 times more than your toilet seat. And we look at ground radiations, which are called geopathic stresses. And we have a non-intrusive way of correcting that. And we've done refineries, airports, a lot of industries, a lot of offices. So we've covered about 100 million square meters. And uh, we measure the health outcomes before and after, like the heart rate and various other questionnaires. So that is briefly what we do. And we actually have touched the lives of about 8 million people. We want to touch the lives of 100 million people by the next two years. So that's briefly about it. Us. Wow, that's super so, fascinating. Joe, I just want to jump in here, piggyback a little bit on, I think, what Ajay has been talking about. It's really spot on, Ajay, and thank you for joining. I finally found a function to request you to come on stage, and that's how the magic mm. happened. So thank I apologize, you, uh, you know, uh, we well, it took a little bit uh, time mm. to do so, but it's fascinating and I think it's really admirable um, with everything you're doing and how many lives you've touched and spot on in terms of how the customer is changing. Um, and I think particularly in the context of India, um, obviously, you know, there's 1.3 billion people. Uh, social distancing is not a thing. Uh, and I think that's just really something hard to grapple for the rest of the world. Um, 
actually, you know, in such a densely populated part of the world, the same sort of measures uh, are simply not a viable option. Um, and, and just has been amazing seeing the innovation coming out of India and sort of like the Silicon Valley turning towards India too over the past year and a half. So back to you, Jerry, just uh, had a quick uh, uh, something to Thank add. You. So, and, and I'll just say uh, the pandemic and, and its state in different countries varies. Uh, I mean, some countries are in different places. So when we talk about what has to happen and what the future world might look like, it, we're actually, I think, going to see that it doesn't happen smoothly on a global basis, but it sort of happens in pockets. Um, certainly from my perspective, when we were in the midst of the pandemic, uh, there was – by, by necessity, there was a lot less human interaction, I think, in the market. So you had to sort of find ways to sell things, deliver products and services with less human interaction. Um, I think as we're starting to see things um, step into a recovery mode, I think you see some of that start to go away. But I am noticing, and this is just a personal observation, that people still are um, I don't know whether reluctance is the right word, but there's a preference to sort of not do physical meetings unless it's really required. Um, whether that's a, an abundance of caution, uh, that's a possibility. But I think part of it is that COVID has sort of forced us to sort of learn how to work in that virtual world. And now people just, I mean, if you have a choice of traveling or not traveling, you can be much more efficient if you're not traveling. So I think there's, there's this desire to be much more virtual in the way we interact with each other. I think that's spot on. I would just say, like, you know, in the early parts of the pandemic, we were discussing, okay, well, do executives really have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, traveling around the world when things could be done virtually? Uh, but I think... For me, where things are currently is that how do we take this learning? Because pandemics are like once in a lifetime situations, right? And this finger, memory. Finger, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Uh, you know, that's not, if, if we don't change our habits and behaviors and what brought us to this point, that is going to happen again. That's a given. But, um, but I would say that, you know, with, uh, with the, the memory and how it's, has affected all of us, you know, and for, for those of us who are trying to build a more responsible world, we take that uh, input, right, and it changes the trajectory of the system for the lack of a better term, right? In economics, we call it path dependency, uh, that the system retains memory forever. And my hope and the reason why this, this panel is so exciting for me is that Hopefully, good things emerge from the pandemic because we learn our lessons. And, and most important of them are around behavioral change. This is not news at all to complex system scientists, something I've been studying, working, researching, writing on, teaching over the past years. The very first computational model you build is this, like, you know, single pathogen that goes and infects the whole system. So it's, uh, it's uh, you know... Uh, it's it's people have been calling it a black swan. We wrote a piece on it uh, a year and a half ago, March last year. That's actually not a black swan event. It's actually a a, a, a gray rhino. It's a known unknown rather than an unknown unknown. Um, right from a risk management perspective, and ever since we've done a whole bunch of work on how do you build systems that are not just resilient and robust, but actually anti-fragile, which means they actually grow under stressors, um, which is really what the natural world looks like, and similar to like the human body too, right, has a natural healing capacity. The more you uh, stress on it, and of course there's a certain limit to it, it actually gets stronger. But, but I think that's an interesting point. I mean, the question, though, is I think it becomes not just well, – I mean, we travel less, so maybe we're spending less time on airplanes and less playing, doing more stuff, video conferencing through email. Um, I personally am finding a couple of things. One of that is that because of that, that time efficiency, I've taken on more work. So, so I'm actually finding, even though the pandemic, you're not working at home, I'm finding people are actually more stressed out but it's because of different things. And instead of being travel-induced 
stress being away from the family or whatever. Now it's like you're taking on more things. So in some way, I kind of wonder whether we're just going to change, trade one kind of a negative for another negative. So that I would have, be unfortunate. Uh, may I? Uh, sure. Uh, Go ahead, AJ. Yeah. So I have a bit of a view here because I feel that the pandemic, it's not a one-time thing because now there's a lot of money to be made with the pandemic by so many players. And whether it's airports, so I was talking to the Bombay airport people and they make more money out of the testing of uh, the coronavirus than they make out of the airport operations. And so it goes for the pharmaceutical companies and a whole lot of other players. So I think unless we reduce the kind of medication and the kind of interventions whether it be by way of vaccinations, whether it be by way of medications, our body is a super intelligent system. And it's like a Windows program. So if you put a Windows 9, then the Windows 7 won't work. So if you put a vaccination, the broad brush immunity that your body can create is definitely compromised. And it's just about where we go. As far as the stress is concerned, one of the things is without more work at home, you are more connected to the all the electromagnetic radiation. And that makes us fatigued and much more tired because you don't have any respite. You know, you can do 10 hours with various conferences and, you know, with various meetings. So I think th there is something where we need to go back to more natural things and create a balance. We have to meet people sometimes. So this virtual thing right now, while it's working, but I think long-term people-to-people contact. Maybe we have learned how to do with much less travel and we will be much more cost-conscious and economical, but I think we'll have to balance. Yeah. What do you think, Angela? Well, I'm trying to not comment on the vaccination situation for COVID, <laughs> um, but that aside, I, I think the virtual world is changing for sure um and the conferences in person are still better than virtual um that's just my experience is that human interaction and kind of spontaneous brainstorming power and lots of uh kind of spur the moment creative discussions um kind of requires everyone to be in the room at the same time in person so as a scientist, lots of scientific discussions require that kind of setting. And it's kind of exciting to do that. And, and I think that's the thing that we all miss a lot in the bio industry. Everyone is having virtual conference fatigue, so to speak. Um, yeah, so, so we're looking forward to getting out of the virtual setting for sure. Yeah, but for but you do you have to change as a as a company you have to change the way you, you deal with your customers um, and some things you do have to have to do you want to do because it's a better outcome if you do it face to face but there's a lot of things that I think will stay as kind of things we do virtually um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, now, of course, if, as the markets change, that means the entrepreneurs have to change. Um, so that makes sort of the, the chicken and egg kind of question. So uh, have, have you guys seen a lot of changes happening sort of amongst how we do innovation and amongst the entrepreneurial community? Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, great question, Jerry. Um, so the answer is a, a yes, all caps. Uh, you know, I think uh, that's why we still have systems running. We still have food in our house and, um, you know, you uh, fill in the blank. Um, one of the things that I will quote is that we recently did a study on supply chain networks around the world and if uh, emerging technologies can help uh, make them um you know, better and more reliable with just-in-time delivery and the and the move and, and sort of the obsession with efficiency. Um, what actually happened was supply networks around the world became very fragile, right? And uh, with uh, any demand shock at this pandemic being one, um, 
you know, they, they, they broke down under stress. And of course, we've seen that with the shortages of uh, personal protective equipment, first in uh, UK and US, then in India, and now happening in Indonesia. Now, of course, with uh, the pandemic, these are, this is a matter of life and death, uh, right? And, and a lot of people have died waiting for um, you know, equipment uh, and, and, and oxygen that uh, there has to be this way. And so does innovation need to change? Yes, absolutely. Uh, in, in many ways, it's also about remembering that the optionality that we previously had is important, that there's a trade-off. And that's something to learn from economics, right? Something economics teaches you is that there are always trade-offs. So with efficiency, there's a trade-off between you know, a trade-off with resilience. Uh, there's a trade-off with having option B, having a system to fall back on. So, you know, when I think of innovation in the sort of the global scale, and in this case, particularly focused on an economy like India, which is highly complex, you know, a lot of it is informal. Uh, there are a lot of other pull and push factors. Um, and then, you know, the socioeconomic systems are and institutions in particular are not as advanced and um, as, as sort of in the West, right? So um, whether it's the executive branch or the judiciary of the country. Uh, and I look at global innovation like, hey, let's learn from this experience that there are going to be more and more demand shocks um, and also supply stresses in the world. Uh, as the climate crisis intensifies. Unless something drastic changes, we're already on a trajectory that uh, more of such crisis would happen just the year 2020. You know, again, it's not just about the pandemic, right? It was also the, the wildfires in California. It was also the breakdown of the electricity grid in Texas, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's all those things. And again, I'm just using examples from the U.S. and that's just because this is the economy I know best at the current moment. Um, but, you know, when it comes to innovating, the way we innovate has to change from the Silicon Valley style of innovation, where there's a lot of resources. There's always a search for the unicorns. Um, and I think we can actually learn a lot from India where there is this notion of uh, chart, right, which is uh, frugal innovation and innovation that is um, specific to the context and it's not necessarily capital intensive so much. Um, and, and I could go on and there are amazing examples from, from Africa as well. How do you innovate with uh, limited resources um, and, 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 and learn to deploy our resources better, right? So, so let me pause here and, and uh, have the other panelists. Yeah. So I'm going to say a couple of things here. One is I feel that innovation has to push the boundaries of science. So right now there is a mindset that this is what is scientific and this is what is engineering and things like that. But real innovation has only happened whether it was for the chip or for anything when you step beyond what is considered as science. So innovation has to begin with thought and that thought has to, you have to see how it works out with people. We have to use a lot of empirical sciences. We can't discard what has happened for thousands of years saying that it's old and irrelevant. We have to examine its relevant in, relevance in the present context and see whether it works. And then put a scientific theory possible. The other thing I feel is that there has to be, I think there is more world. It's not that India is, uh, because there is a lot of osmosis, a lot of technologies being used in India which are worldwide and vice versa. So we have to have more of a pan-world collaboration and we have to have targeted markets. We have to have more R&D spends. And I think the mindset of the decision makers has to change as to what can be done, what cannot be done. And one of the things which I'm looking at here is if the world has to be actually move on beyond this crisis, we have to look at taxation in a different way. The countries of the world have to look at uh, less taxation. And uh, I would also say that when you talk about innovation, there is a mindset that it's only the young people who can innovate. But if you see the real examples around the world, you will find that as many older people or even sometimes more older people 
are actually bringing in innovations based on their experience because some of them know what works and what doesn't work so these are the few thoughts i had and i thought i'll share and did you have some some thoughts i think the funding areas um pre and post covid um are definitely changing as you know biotech is a resource intensive industry so most companies most startups and most innovations require a lot of funding um they initially begin with government as in nih grants and other things um and then they if they are commercializable innovation they eventually move into a private investor funded world and so because of that um most commercialized medications eventually that reach clinical trials require heavy heavy amount of funding and and so far only areas that are interested um that seem interesting to investors get funded but i think this this brings us to the post and the pre pandemic is that the areas that are interesting to investors are now changing it used to be heavily focused on um ai driven methods um of drug discovery for example and then also used to be very heavy on oncology and immuno oncology for the industry um they're they're starting to change because investors realize there are other areas that everyone needs to focus on um people thought that infectious disease was never going to be a big thing but look at the covid world it's an infection um of a viral um particle that you can't see but you know if we didn't have medications for a lot of the very severe um uh phenotypes of covid for example lungs and respiratory functions and other heart and um functions um these are also areas that that medication would be great um and an investment is needed so i think some of these are kind of getting in as people realize that there's a lot more new things that they could fund um and develop and um hopefully less focus on the traditional areas of oncology and um and other like inflammatory diseases that have gotten a lot of focus in the past so so i, I have a question but never can you pull tim Nich- tim nickel into um the speaker panel whatever you did before sorry who's that tim tim nickel he's he's on our on the right hand side of the screen sure so i i think it's uh, it's co- sort of curious um and i don't know if this is this is just a coincidence um but it does seem like um for the entrepreneur i mean that there've been two big problems i think challenges for entrepreneurs one of them is being able to find um vc funding and that process has always been a bit chaotic um i kind of wonder whether this move to remoteness has actually made the vc community um to move it to a point to where it's just as easy to invest in a a country that's around the globe as one that's down the street uh because if you're online talking to the entrepreneurs it's really the same process and maybe that's why we're seeing companies funded more globally more interested in that the other thing i kind of wonder about <coughs> excuse me is uh the other problem that entrepreneurs have always faced is if you have something new how do you get it in front of your customers so you can get market feedback and and sort of learn and grow your product um as you as you enter the market um and maybe um, this is just a a question maybe be, now that we've become more global um it, the investors are actually starting to put more money into um companies that are close have an easier time finding new markets um so so maybe that's a change that might be i don't know if anyone thinks that that's really what's happening but uh I'll throw that out there just to see what you guys think I think a lot of interactions um are made in the virtual world um by investors and they're looking for innovation um but i'm not sure the final relationship between investors and innovation can can really be a solid relationship without in person meetings um personally 
usually they require、um, in-person interactions because that's they want the whole team. They want to、um, go over some of the product and technology in person. So, so I think the initial relationship kind of just meet and greet can be done virtually. Um, and then a lot of other discussions they prefer to do in person. Although I'm well aware that many large deals have been done during the pandemic, and then people say that it's virtual, so it's possible to do things virtually, for sure. But I think there's a slight preference for in person. So yeah, and, and clearly there are things you can do in person that you can't do um, otherwise. Um, I, I I know I for one I grew up in a large multinational company, and I'm used and very comfortable to an environment where you're dealing with employees and customers across huge distances. I, I think there's a different set of skills that are needed to sort of thrive in that environment.、Um, but it's it's an interesting kind of question for sure.、Um, AJ, AJ, you mentioned. Um, change, perhaps like tax policy and and things like that.、Um, I know when when I looked at the list of things pre pandemic and post pandemic,、um, it it struck me that a lot of the the thinking about what's important for government policy.、Um, I mean, it was designed with the intent of shipping physical goods. Whereas now that we've come more virtual, there's a lot more digital goods. And that sort of implies that maybe governments have a lot of rethinking to do、um, if the world truly is a digital world compared to a physical world. Yeah. So that the blurring of the line because a lot of products, like let's say this chip that we make for the phone, now we are working on how to make an app where the same benefit can be given to the customer、uh, digitally at、uh, maybe one twentieth of the cost. So similarly, there are going to be a lot of other products. So this, the governments must realize that if they are going to tax physical goods a lot, a lot of those services will be、uh, rendered in different ways, and maybe that's that's the way forward as well. So in any case, the revenue will go down, and they so they'll have to rethink this whole piece and give a lot of more. Uh, uh, Encouragement and stops for research and development because that is what is going to get the economy up in any case. Okay. Good, good, good.、Um, the the other thing, and and if we want to go to sort of a different direction, I know、um, there's a lot more attention is being put on social networks and how much they control our lives as we've gone to sort of a digital world. They become much more important, and I think that sort of attracted that attention. Um, but there's also been a lot of attention from the government has been now put on privacy, security,、um, and things like that. And, and it, it's sort of interesting that while the business world has sort of had to rapidly ad- adapt, I think the government policy is still sort of working in、um, a cleanup mode.、Um, how do you fix the spilt milk rather than how do you prevent milk from being spilt? So we one of the things. Sorry, I just want to say that when we talk about、uh, this, we say this is the age of information technology. So somewhere, what has happened is when we talk about, we have to differentiate between information and knowledge, because what we we often mistake information for knowledge. Because in the digital world, you are the more you pay for it, more of what you are saying and the way you want to control the world or governments or consumers. That information is coming up front, but I think if we really want to move forward, we'll have to control about how are we going to differentiate information and knowledge. How are we going to see that people are actually thinking about what is workable or not? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, do you have anything you want to add to that? Or- Um, I can jump in here.、Um, super interesting question for sure. I think、uh, Ajay, your point is、uh, spot on.、Uh, actually, I remember writing a footnote in my thesis work on how information and knowledge are treated、uh, as synonyms, but it shouldn't be.、Uh, 
2014 when I finished my thesis work at Harvard Kennedy. Um, and so you're, so you're right, you know, the question of policy now, again, uh, I have a lot to say. We've been writing a series of policy papers guiding governments, analyzing what they've done over the past year and a half on how to build a better um, digital economy and not just always be doing the cleanup, Jerry, to your point. Uh, the, the trouble is, at least in the U.S., the kind of attitude we have, and it's a fairly, I guess, global, is that, um, oh, we don't want to hinder innovation. We want to let industry, you know, go as far as they want to unless they break something. Now, the problem with that is by the time you get to that point, uh, when you find out that something's broken, a lot of damage has been done, you are <laughs> you are stuck with a lot of broken things, right? And then the other challenge is you have to be big enough of a player for a small agency, for example, like the SEC, there are upward of 30 regulators in the United States, um, government at the federal level, um, it has to be big enough. It has to be a big enough fish for them to make an example out of it. Otherwise, they wouldn't look at you. So, so there's there's all of that sort of complexity. Uh, when the truth is, right, and this is the important part. The truth is, the government is an enabler. We have Teslas on the roads because, uh, by the way, Elon Musk got around five hundred million dollars of taxpayer dollars as. Uh, as, as grants and funds and subsidies. So, and, and, you know, space from the government to actually test the car. And there's this like, so much of a negative narrative, which is so damaging when actually, and, and I'm sure Angie can speak to this a lot more because for natural sciences, particularly for, uh, you know, uh, in, in medicine uh, and, and biotechnology, governments are the first uh, enablers. But we don't have that attitude in the, in the, in the Silicon Valley, uh, which is counterproductive rather than seeing governments as allies, um, engaging them. And same for governments. Um, I think the problem is not just that attitude is, you know, of entrepreneurs towards governments or voters towards governments. In fact, the, the people who are in the government also believe that they are a problem. Uh, rather than an enabler of innovation. Like, how sad can this get? <laughs> so, you know, and that's uh, that for me is a little heartbreaking. The book I recommend here is The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis, who's a master storyteller. I read that book and I, I massively started to admire the, the amount of responsibilities, just for example, the U.S. government has on its shoulders and the risk portfolio globally that it runs. And that of course applies to a lot of other governments too, uh, but of course being a superpower. So I think my, my own perspective has shifted from sort of seeing the government as a problem to say, well, how do we engage stakeholders? And, and I would just say like everything that we do, we always make sure that is the case, that multiplicity of perspectives, backgrounds, um, and you know voices and which part of you know, the economy you're representing and what your incentives are and, you know, what your mandate is when it comes to policy and government is accurately represented. Um, and, and again, I can speak more to that, but I'm cognizant of the fact that we have two minutes left in the panel. So, Jerry, I'm going to give it back to you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and mm-hmm. with that, I mean, I, I, think, I think certainly the pandemic has changed the world for for entrepreneurs, for innovation, to where there's a lot more opportunity. Um, that also means um, there's a lot more risk also because a lot of these ideas simply won't pan out and the world's changing so fast. Um, I think we're headed into a period of sort of hyper um, evolution. Um, I think if you, if you a look at some of the early evolutionary theory, the idea was is that evolution isn't a steady thing. It sort of happens in spurts. And I think we're in one of those moments with relationship to um, innovation where we're spurting along with a lot of changes. A- AJ made the comment earlier about about how a lot of entrepreneurs are, n- are now older. I think the I saw somewhere that the average um, age of a successful entrepreneur is like 54. Um, I, I think the, the pandemic has made um, people with uh, more experience. It's not just 
the innovators are not just the young, but you're kind of looking to build an organization that includes young and old. Um, and, I, and I think this is an opportunity for that. I think that does help make things more human centric. Um, and it brings in, gives us an opportunity to bring in um, more um, pr different perspectives into the innovation process. And I think that helps things in the end. So I'm actually pretty hopeful for how this will all turn out, even though right now it seems kind of chaotic. Um, I think it's, it's ultimately going to prove to be a good thing. That's a lot of I optimism for past three years. Yeah, for a long time. <laughs> yeah, the other prime minister. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, we're we're past our time. Um, I want to thank everybody. This has been a, a really interesting conversation, um, and and thank thank the the people who attended as well. Um, hopefully, feel free to reach out to any of us if you want afterwards through the platform, or if you want to send us an email directly. Um, some really interesting points to think about. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. You. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks everyone for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Shout out to, to Tim here. Each oh, one yes. of you separately. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.